If you're watching this video, you're most likely going to build a PC soon and you would need to get better information on how to build a PC. And that's what exactly what I'll be going through in this video. I'll go through the entire process of assembling the PC so that you can make less mistakes while you're doing it. I'll also be providing a bit of tips on how to avoid common mistakes which most users find during their first PC builds. So today I'll be assembling this PC which will be my daily driver and hence I'll be using mostly for video editing as well as some light gaming. Apart from that it's mostly for uh, multimedia purposes and just common use. This PC build costs around 50,000 and will be mostly focused on video editing as its primary function. So most of the components which goes into this build is meant for video editing. So if you are looking for a gaming PC, do not consider this as a suggestion or a recommendation for a PC build and see it only as a guide for assembling a PC. Alright, so first let's get the basics sorted out. For building a PC, what do you need and what are the few basic components which you need in order to build a PC? You are going to need at least 6 basic components to build a PC. Starting with the CPU or the processor and then you have the motherboard, the RAM, then the storage devices, power supply. Now in certain cases of processors, it may not have an integrated graphics processing unit built into it. In such cases, you are going to need a discrete graphics card or a GPU. In this build, I will be using one such processor which does not have an integrated graphics solution and hence, I will be using a separate graphics card for my processing power needs. Also, if you are someone who uses much more graphics intensive softwares or have requirements for uh, graphics performance, then you are going to need a graphics card. Alright, so I guess that's enough talk and let's get right into it. I have a couple of 8GB RAMs here, a 1TB hard drive, a 450W power supply, a GTX 1060 graphics card, a B350 motherboard, a 500GB SSD and finally a Ryzen 5 3600. Alright, so first let's open this up. First we have the Kingston A2000 M.2 SSD. The Ryzen 3600 is here and let's mount it onto the motherboard. All you have to do is place the processor onto the socket by aligning with the tiny little triangle which you will find on the surface of the processor. And that's it, just lock the latch and you're good to go. Next we have the heatsink here. But let's move it out of the way for a moment. Before mounting the heatsink, we have to apply a thin layer of thermal paste onto the surface. If you don't know why, hit the link in the top or in the description to find out. So now we prepare the surface by cleaning it off with a cleaning tissue supplied along with the thermal paste. Do note that this has to be done now only because I am reusing my existing processor for this video and have to ensure that there is no residual thermal paste from the previous installation. Now once both surfaces are cleaned, I have the Cooler Master Master Gel Pro here which I'll apply. Like that. You can also check out the review of this thermal paste in the description or somewhere on the top of this video. Now all you need to do is simply place the heatsink on top and screw it in. But wait. You need a base plate if you're going to mount the heatsink which will look like this and can be found in the motherboard packaging. It is always better to place this first so as to avoid aligning half blindedly. Once you place it underneath the motherboard with the corners aligned with the holes on the motherboard, you are good to screw in the heatsink. Now when it comes to screwing in, this is something you should consider. This heatsink has a spring loaded screw which does tend to put your board under some pressure while screwing in. To avoid bending of the board and to ensure equal mounting pressure, please do as suggested. Screw in the first top right corner just enough so that the spring is pressed against and a few treads have turned or in other words only screw in a bit and then you drive in the diagonally opposite screw again only a bit. Next you can go with any of the either remaining two screws followed by its diagonal opposite. Once all four screws have been lightly driven in, you are safe to go and just screw in all of them completely until you can't anymore. Once it's all in, you will know and won't have to apply any further pressure. It should be with stable now and shouldn't wobble. If it does wobble, you have not driven in the screws correctly and you should remount it. 
So once that's done, connect the fan on the heatsink to the motherboard CPU fan header which will likely be labeled as such. So what next? RAMs. I have the Gamix D30 here and a Corsair Vengeance LPX, both of which are 8GB RAMs and will be going into these DDR4 RAM slots you see. Notice how there's a color difference in the RAM slots? That is to denote the pair of RAM slots you can use to achieve dual channel configuration of RAMs, which is basically running the RAMs over two channels so that it gets double the bandwidth. Think of it as a two lane road versus a single lane road, but for data transfer. Now all you have to do is pull up the small latches on the RAM slots and slide it in until you hear a click sound when the latch locks on. Next. Here's my Kingston A2000, which is a great value SSD and its full review will be out shortly. So if you want to watch that, make sure you subscribe and click on that notifications icon to be one of the first to know when I upload new content. Now since this is an M.2 SSD, it goes right into the M.2 slot on the motherboard. Installation of the SSD is as simple as sliding into the slot and then pressing it down. Make sure that your board has a standoff for the SSD to hold on to. Depending on the board, this might either be already present on the board or will be provided in a separate sachet. Hope you didn't lose it since it might not be easy to come by if you do happen to lose it. So once that's screwed in, that's about what we can do from outside the case. Now let's get this into the case. Firstly, I would apologize for the weird video on the inside of the case, but then I like the weirdness so I decided to keep it. Skip a couple seconds if you don't. Now we place in the motherboard and I'm holding it by the heatsink since that's in most comfortable and convenient. Before you place in the motherboard though, you should definitely check for standoffs on the case which is where you place the motherboard on. If you don't have standoffs on it, it's likely to be in the box your case came in. Pick those up and screw them in first wherever needed. Refer the motherboard layout for these standoff placements. Without these, you'll most definitely short circuit your board when the back of it comes in contact with the case or at least there's a very high chance and I would not risk it. Also, I'm not even sure these motherboard mounting screws would go into the case directly without standoffs. Okay, so just when you think you had placed it right, you realize that you had missed out on the IO shield which goes into that empty vertical slot at the rear side of the case. This is 2021. I think it should come attached with the motherboard as it does on the higher end boards. How hard would it be? Placing the IO shield was a little finicky but you will know when it goes in. Now you can just place the motherboard, screw it in and be done with it. The screws will not come with the motherboard and will hopefully be bundled in your case. Now that the motherboard is fixed, turn that case around and let's get to the messy side of the case. Get that side panel off and depending on your case, you can expect a similar or different design but in most modern cases, this is where you mount your power supply, hard drives and manage all the cables. Now since this is a non-modular power supply, you cannot remove the unnecessary cables so it is more likely to make a mess with the cables flying around. It is always a good idea to get a good power supply, preferably with modularity if you are going for higher end build. Now I have a hard disk cage here which is removable. Once the hard disk is inserted into the cage, it can be mounted back to the case. Next, to mount the power supply, simply slide it in to the space sideways and then screw it in from the rear. Now comes the cables. First, the two primary cables that powered the build. The 24 pin ATX connector for the motherboard which is the widest looking one and the 8 pin connector for the CPU. Make sure that this is in fact the 8 pin connector for the CPU and not the 8 pin PCI Express connector used for the graphics card. In this case, I leave out the 8 pin CPU connector at the top which is where most boards have their CPU connectors and the 24 pin connector through one of the larger holes as shown. Just go with whichever is convenient. Next, we repeat this with the 8 pin PCI connector for the graphics card and the SATA power connector for the hard drives. Route them as required and next we have the Molex connectors. Now the fans on this case may either be connected to the motherboard through an ARGB hub so that the speed and the lights on the fans may be controlled through software or it can just be directly connected to a Molex cable like this one which will supply it power but you'd be missing out on any sort of control over it unless you have a hardware switch to change the lights like this one does on the case. Next we have here the most annoying connectors, the front panel connectors. For the power button, restart button, hard drive status LED and the power LED. These are just too tiny to hold and connect to the appropriate pins 
especially if you have relatively larger heads. The pins where these connect to are also super close to each other which makes it a small nightmare to get it right. Also, if connected wrong, the PC won't boot and you might risk damaging the board as well. Although this is unlikely, I would be careful around it. Route those front panel connectors towards the front from the bottom holes and you're almost set. Couple more cables from the case like the USB headers, speaker connectors etc might also need to go through the front through one of these holes so that you can flip over to the other side and connect the rest. Also, connect those SATA cables or SATA data cables to your hard drives and the other end of the motherboard. It is fairly straightforward. Now on to the flip side. Pull those cables carefully as required and connect them to the right ports. I would ideally get the front panel connectors done with first so as to get it over with. While the board might have the connector pins labeled, it might be too difficult to read. So it would be a good idea to go through the user manual that came with the motherboard or simply look up a digital user manual from the motherboard manufacturer's website. Now that I'm done with the front panel connector, it's time to whip out the ancients. Enter GTX 1060. The GPU goes right into the PCI Express slot. Now while the board does appear to have two of them, only one of them provides the full bandwidth recommended for this GPU, which is generally the closest to the CPU and that's where we'll be mounting this. But before I can mount this, you'll notice that the case has some PCI slot covers which needs to be taken out. Since this is a two slot thick GPU, I'll be removing two of these covers. And that's why you verify the position of the GPU first before prying out the PCI slot covers. Simply push the GPU onto the slot and you'll hear a click sound when a latch locks onto the GPU. Then screw this onto the case so that the board does not have to carry the entire weight of the GPU on its PCI slot. Once mounted, plug in the PCI Express 6 plus 2 pin connector or the 8 pin connector to the GPU. Once you're comfortable and satisfied with that, move on to the 24 pin ATX cable. The motherboard port is fairly large and obvious so it should be easy enough to connect this cable and there's almost no way to go wrong with this so long as it's a snug fit. Next is the 8 pin CPU connector. Again, you can't go wrong here, it's an 8 pin connector. Push it in, apologies for the lack of video. Some entry level CPUs require only 4 pins and entry level boards might also have only a 4 pin slot. In such cases, unclip the 8 pin connectors which would divide it into two 4 pin connectors and just connect the one which fits the socket. Time to connect our USB peripherals and display cables and switch on for the first boot. Alright, so let's switch on power supply. The motherboard lights seems to have turned on which is a good sign and now let's turn on the PC. Alright, so that took about 22 seconds for the first boot which is expected. Now it has booted into the BIOS screen due to lack of operating system and everything looks alright. The motherboard has detected both RAMs, storage devices and is running at an acceptable temperature. So good job. Now here's a pro tip. Before placing the motherboard into the case, connect the bare minimum components onto the board and try to boot. This is called a benchboard build and will help in saving a lot of time if any of the components happen to be faulty. That's about it. Have fun building a PC, always look out for tutorials and reach out for help if in doubt. Let me know in the comment section if you have any doubts, suggestions or feedback related to the content in this video or in general. Thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel and if you haven't already, like and share this video with anyone who might need it. Until next time.